Okay, I understand we can start. So, thanks everybody for coming. And this is a talk about Freezer. The backup and restore as a service with a disaster, uh, providing also a disaster recovery solution in OpenStack. And at least that's the idea. And uh, we are going now to explain uh, quite quickly the, the architecture and the components and where each components run. So basically, of course, there are the API that uh, are the, 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 the central point for storing the metadata of any action that it's, it's, it's being executed by all the other components. The API, it's also the component that is being uh, like, uh, queried by the, the web interface uh, integrated in Horizon to, to display metrics, information, and also to, to configure backups, jobs, action, and, and so on. So one important thing to understand probably is that Freezer follow a distributed architecture this means that the, the, all the actions are executed by an agent that generally it's running on the node where your data is in most of the cases. There is also, so this is mainly the, 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 like the, the role of the, of the agent. Another important uh, component is the freezer scheduler that is a long running daemon that takes the information, retrieves the information from the API and writes back uh, metrics and information and, uh, to the API and execute the freezer, the freezer agent accordingly. It's possible, it provides uh, scheduling features and also <clears throat> a kind of orchestration and dependencies <clears throat> on multiple tasks belonging to the same job. So it can execute multiple, multiple uh, actions and not only, uh, not only the agent itself. Another important part of, the, of, the, of course of the equation is the storage. Where are we going to store and uh, to back to store and like to, to retrieve the data from the backup that we, we execute uh, daily, hourly and, and so on. Currently, the, the, the storage media supported in the Freezer project are three, uh, which is Swift, an SSH remote node, and a local file system, for example, an NFS attached volume. And the, 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 inter the interesting part of it is that you can execute, um, you can store the data in parallel to more than one storage media. So for, example, for instance, you can store the data on two Swift server in parallel with independent credentials. And also you can do on uh, Swift plus SSH in case you want to restore your data uh, if the API or Swift or Keystone is not available. So you can do both or three and, and pretty much any combination. And uh, this is a, a general overview on the, on the architecture, and now we are going to focus more, more on what, what we did, what we have of most uh, significant, and then going forward, or, or what we are going to provide. Okay. So the first uh, interesting feature is the, are the job sessions. The job sessions is, I think it's a quite unique feature because it allows the user to execute synchronized backups on multiple nodes. Whether the nodes are physical or virtual machine, you, can, you have, like, uh, in cases where your, for example, for instance, your data set is spreaded across multiple nodes and you have to reduce the inconsistency uh, risks, you can, you can use, leverage the job sessions to execute uh, backups on multiple nodes synch um, synchronized. So how does it work quickly? Basically, there are n jobs belonging to the same job sessions ID, and there is the agent that pulls from the API, and when it, it detects that the, there is a job set uh, with, with the job session to the other, to the other uh, with, with other nodes, with the job session ID tag, the, the, the backup and the action are executed accordingly. So how do we manage the fact that simultaneously on multiple nodes, the data is changing? That is the, probably the, the biggest thing. So 
there is no 100% safe solution to that. What, what can be provided is uh, reducing the risks of data corruption. So in Freezer, this, the, the, in this case, uh, the, the first task in the job will be to create a, a, a file system snapshot as much as possible to the, to the uh, reduced time window on all the nodes. This assumes that all the nodes are synchronized with an, an NTP server. So after the snapshot on the file system is taken with the, with the most reduced time windows, as I said, so we have a point in time data snapshot, then all the backups, all the freezer agent on multiple nodes can take the backup and, and all belongings to the same job session. So this is about the, the job session. Okay. Another feature that it's, it's to be delivered is in, is under review, if you fancy a code review, it's the, the block-based incremental. So the way we are providing a block-based incremental is by using an R-Sync approach. So we are, for, are doing an R-Sync implementation in Python. It's a slightly different because with R-Sync, you need to have the, the source and destination file available on the file system. But in, in the way we are doing it, like uh, all the, the, um, the freezer agent basically run through the file system. So for each file, uh, generate a signature, a hash for each block, it's stored in metadata, and then on the next run, that metadata is retrieved, and the, the hash are, are matched uh, uh, against the current execution. So if there is a change in the block, the block is saved, otherwise not. So there is no need, this, can be, uh, this approach can be used with, uh, with an object storage, basically. So we are offering, uh, providing two algorithms, sorry, we are going to provide two algorithms, which is the rolling checksum with one byte shift. So this, all, this is useful to check repetition of the blocks within the file at any offset. The problem with this is that it is uh, uh, time and resource intensive. By other side, it provides back bandwidth and storage efficiency. The other option we are, we are uh, providing to speed up the thing, because it's some, with, with quite like starting from medium data set size, it's, it's slow. We are modifying the rsync algorithm, and we, rather than uh, having a window of a one byte to check the, the existence of the block within the file, we shift block by block. So the block size is the shift uh, rather than one byte of, of offset. So this reduces a lot the, the computation of hash and also the matching, the, the, the comparison. Another interesting thing of the, the things uh, side is that it's the, the, the restore is in stream as well as the backup. So when you, when you restore the data, even incrementally, there is no need to download the data prepare the data, rebuild all the data set, and then move to the, to the, to the location where the application points to, to, to read and write the data. So there is no, let's say, additional uh, space requirement and costs for, for, for in the restore. Of course, the, 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 all the, the, the um, actions happen, are, are the computing is executed on blocks of data in memory. So, there is some, some, some memory usage. So now let's go to the challenge a bit. Uh, this is the, 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 the questions that everybody are having. So same question, different, different service. And it is how to scale. How do we scale? And what does mean scaling in backup, restore, and, and, uh, and disaster recovery also? So, how can we execute incrementals on, on more than 500 terabytes? The reality is, by fact, that a lots of users, companies, and, and, and environments have uh, data sets and storage and, and way more than 500 ter terabytes. So how do we approach this? The truth is, being totally honest and transparent, is that, that the rolling check, checksum Needs, so that the R-Sync approach needs to reread all the data 
every time to generate the, the, the block hashes, the block checksum, to be compared with the hashes from the previous execution. This is a problem. This is a high issue because rereading every day to check, at the, to check the incrementals of 500 or more terabytes, it's hard to do. Time, mostly time intensive and, and so on. So the current approach doesn't work, I say that. The options are, we have, are, are working on the two options. The first one is to get the list of changed block by uh, the backend storage. Of course, the backend storage needs to support it or leverage the, the, the features of some advanced file system like ZFS and even, even butter file system. But the, we, we believe that we, are, we arrive to the point where we need to write drivers and to better integrate with more advanced stop commercial proprietary storage solutions that can provide uh, these features. So the, 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 the thing will be that when the block is written on the disk, there is one technology like the storage that keep a hash table of that, we retrieve that hash table and we match it. So we do not need to reread all the data to recompute everything. So this is, and this is one option. The other option is that it's, it's one of the rsync algorithm change that I mentioned before that will be um, the, rather than using one byte window shift, we use the block size. This will go uh, faster than the rolling uh, one byte uh, checksum. The thing is that we still need to reread all the data, but it works in case the drivers are not provided or for some reason you can do it. You, we, we offer the, the, we are opening to, with the drivers for, for, to the business and we are also providing uh, out of the box solutions that can work. Another cool thing we are working on is the duplication because it doesn't matter the, the solution is open source, commercial, whatever. Any real enterprise grade and advanced solution of backup provides the duplication. This is the reality. So what, what, what are the challenges? So the first challenge is how to achieve cross-tenant the duplication. So if there is another tenant completely unrelated to, to, to you or to the, to the current tenant, basically if there is a, a block of data that is exactly the same to yours, the duplication, the, the duplication still happen. If we uh, uh, implement successfully, and we are going to do it, this kind of the duplication, there is, in this case, there is no need to use the incrementals anymore. So there is a, quite a big change in the paradigm. And uh, there are other commercial solutions that are doing it, but we are, we are really pushing hard to, to provide some, something equal or better. So uh, another important thing is that we need to maintain a global ta uh, table of, uh, the, of the hashes with the indexes. So each block for the data belonging to every tenant needs to be indexed with the hashes and we need to know, we need to keep that table and query that table very fast, otherwise it will take ages. So it's more likely that we are going to introduce a new component pro, uh, called the freezer DDoP and uh, uh, what basic, the, the basic workflow is that it will get the, the, the data from a stream compute the ashes and send the data to the, 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 to the storage if the hash, if the data is not already, uh, if the hash doesn't match with, with one of the existing mat, uh, hashes in the, in, the, in the global hash table. And this should run where, most likely, where your data is. So we get bandwidth efficiency. Of course, there are risks and limitations for cross tenants. And uh, what are the risks and limitations? So, the encryption, if every tenant encrypts the key, encrypts the data with his own key, it's a problem. Because when the other tenant needs to restore and it's that block of data that has been encrypted with the other tenant key, 
It doesn't have the key, so it cannot be restored. So the encryption with the same key over all the data increases efficiency. So this is one, one, one risk and limitation. The same compression algorithm for all tenants needs to be used, uh, and this will become transparent for the users because it's, it's kind of the same, unless we are going to implement an out, uh, uh, like a, something that will detect automatically which uh, compression algorithm were, were used by each, uh, for each block, we need to use the same compression algorithm. Another issue is the quota management. Why? Because we are going to, in the, with this approach, we are going to have data shared across all tenants. Not shared, but uh, it's, it, it will be not easy, the quota management and knowing every single um, data set size belonging to which tenant. But we are going to do that in Freezer. So that, that is something that needs to be managed. Another issue is that the potential issue is that the cross-tenant data goes to the same bucket. So we, you cannot, we cannot uh, provide, uh, it's not possible to use advanced security strategies like uh, encrypting and splitting the, the, the blocks on different storage media, on different locations. So even by decrypting one, on, one block only, the, the, the attacker couldn't do nothing. So this is a big problem because we are most likely to, to, to have to, to place all the, the, the tenant data in one single bucket. So now we are going on the disaster recovery side and uh, we will talk again later. Thank, thanks. Hello. So, uh, the freezer approach so far, you know, backup, restore, can, can fit the disaster recovery paradigm in some occasion, but um, customer requirements sometimes are uh, a little bit more strict in timing and so on. So we are starting to analyze and think about how to um, have kind of a different approach and um, implement something that is more live. So we started kind of a deep analysis on which, which, which are the kind of problematic we are trying to solve when disaster recovery is needed and uh, how to, to implement a solution to address the most common use cases. So, uh, the, starting from the workload, for example, there is two big uh, uh, kind of paradigm. One is the, the native cloud application that are usually done uh, to avoid the, the, the problem of disaster. So they are massively scalable. They are distributed over multiple data center, multiple rooms, multiple continents even. And in this case, you know, there's little that needs to be done for disaster recovery. There is probably some needs on, on backups because, you know, some vital data needs to be stored somewhere to avoid even human uh, mistakes or, or losing part of the data anyway. Um, the, the, where the disaster recovery is really needed is in case of legacy applications. So um, there is a very long debate about legacy application in the cloud or not in the cloud. The reality is that the world is willing to move the, the, the legacy application to the cloud and then maybe start rewriting them in an appropriate way. In that case, yes, backup is fundamental and solutions for disaster recovery are needed because losing even a single virtual machine could disrupt completely the service they are providing. And this it's, it's what motivates us to, to search for a solution and implement it. So we have started to analyze the 
possible causes of disasters and identify where do, those disasters can happen inside of the infrastructure. Uh, our cloud needs controllers and controllers are already kind of providing uh, a replicable situation. So all the OpenStack APIs, for example, are made to be distributed quite easily. So losing one controller is not a big issue. No disruption in the service, at least. Uh, the storage, if, if this kind of uh, resilient uh, solution is needed, need to be anyway uh, distributed and scalable. And again, losing one single node, is, it's, it's not uh, disrupted services. Compute nodes are a different story because there is not a uh, replicable way of managing them. Virtual machine run on, on each virtual machine run on a single compute node. If a failure happens on a compute node, then we lose virtual machines. Um, the network is another problem. So um, the LAN, for example, the local network can can have issues, and if that, that thing happens, we can lose some and, and a lot, maybe, of all the other components. So human intervention is needed in that case. If the, let's say, internet connection could be another cause of problem, could be disrupted service for who's providing the, the internet connection, or even a DOS attack that will uh, exclude from the internet the data center. These are things that somehow we can try to address. So going a little bit deeper, we kind of try to map what the, the causes, the damage, and the possible remediation to, to address these failures. As we said, Controllers, we can, we can lose one or a few of them without disrupting the service. Uh, we have issues if we lose one entire site because, as we said, legacy, legacy application will be usually in a single data center, losing a site, no application anymore. Uh, compute nodes, losing one node is an issue. Uh, Something can be done. If we are using ephemeral storage, that's even more complicated. It's you, not advisable to have that kind of approach on, on the local disk of compute nodes, because if, if, if one compute node fails, we even lose the data, not only the virtual machines. If we lose one entire side, no compute nodes anymore. The network, as we said, we will try to do our best. So first, first approach is the, the compute node failures. Freezer architecture, as you, you seen before, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, allowing us to, without much changes, but um, some modularization of the code to have additional features. So we try to address the kind of uh, workflow and, and, and the functionality that, that we need to, Im to implement uh, uh, an automatic failover of the compute nodes. So the approach that we are taking is to leverage the, what OpenStack provides as much as possible, starting with a health checker that is it's, uh, um, polling on the Nova APIs, fetching the status of the hypervisor and detecting which one is marked as down. Uh, we have the freezer agent, as my colleague said before, in deploying that in our compute nodes, we can uh, gather and provide information on the status of the node. We have Monasca, that is, or even other monitoring solution. Monasca is the OpenStack 
um, um, specific one that we can we can gather more information and try to decrease the false positive as much as possible because for sure we don't want to evacuate a compute node that in reality is still running. And we can even do more uh, advanced and uh, detect through EPMI this power status or the health check of the, of the nodes. Or watchdog uh, hardware equipment if, if, if available. Uh, once the, the, the failure is detected, the first thing that we need to do, and it's just mandatory, is to fence the node. Fence means kill it definitely. And be sure that it will not come back online again because it, it will cause very bad um, inconvenience, like mounting two times read write the volume and the operating, the operating system will get crazy. Uh, possibly even uh, the, disabling the node, so putting the node in maintenance, so Nova will not even try to uh, use that node, that node anymore. Once the host is fenced, the evacuation can be triggered, and even maybe the live migration, if, if we realize that um, it, it would be useful. Once the evacuation has happened, notifier and notify the impacted user and tenants of, of that node because they are the only one that have access to their own virtual machine and the one that can detect if the application are uh, up and working again. So we really have a POC of, of, uh, of these and it's, it's working quite well. We had to change somehow the arch internal architecture or freezer, let's say, the, the code to be modularized and pluggable. So all this is it's going to be implemented like a uh, customizable workflow where the, the, the cloud administrator can plug in whichever of these functionalities they want. This is a, an overview of the architecture, how we thought of implementing these inside the freezer. So uh, behind the freezer edge, on, on top over there, there is the kind of normal freezer backup way, the scheduler and the agent, uh, storing backups in, in, in storage, let's say, Swift or what is chosen. Uh, but the, the, the scheduler will manage even a new agent, that's the DR agent, and we identify that that agent could provide this the monitoring of the local node, do a kind of graceful fencing, so graceful shutdown of the node if, if it's not completely failed, but we want to evacuate that anyway. We, we can, like we do in, in normal freezer, execute custom action on, on top of this before or after the events are happening, and then we can we can use that to to manage the the network part that need to be taken care in case that we are doing these on different data centers or things like that. And we see we're going to see more details on that later. The behind the freezer APIs there will be a, a, a freezer DR engine that is a long running service that is kind of the orchestrator of all the action that is going to happen when the disasters are, are happened. So once we, we had a clear idea and a solution for the smaller problem of single nodes failing or a low number, and we want to uh, move the workload inside of a, a single site, we started to think about how to do that in larger scale and have a, a, a disaster solution between multiple sites. So 
the first point is to have a mm, segregation or an, a, a, let's say division between the two sides and uh, availability zone or host aggregation is probably the, the, the best way to, to achieve that. And then we started thinking about, so what is going to be needed to have a disaster recovery solution? The, for the, the biggest problem is the replication of the data. So without having the data in the, in the DR data center, it's almost impossible to restart the workload over there. So the three main uh, kind of data that we need to replicate are the database used by, by OpenStack, uh, let's say MySQL, it's, it's possible to have a, a, a distributed cluster, it depends on the delay of the network and a few things, this can be done in a kind of master, master way or in a master slay way. The block storage, uh, as we said before, the advice is to, to go in that direction, avoid ephemera if, if possible. But the cinder backends used for storing the volumes need to be replicated over, over the data centers. Uh, again, there are open source solutions, there are proprietary hardware specific. Uh, there are solutions to do this kind of replication. Depending on the delay, it could be synchronous or asynchronous. It's, it's uh, on, the, on, on the cloud administrator to design their cloud in, in the appropriate way to have this uh, happening. The other storage that we need to replicate is the object storage. Usually is used at least for, for glance as the backend. So it's, it's an easier problem to solve than the block storage. And uh, most of the, of the object storage solution have this capability, have at least one, op one replica of the data in the secondary data center. Uh, and so we designed the workflow that need to happen once, once a disaster sadly happened. Like for compute nodes, we need to be sure that the, the failed site will not come online again. There will be collision in the network. There will be um, uh, uh, writes that go through the block storage or the object storage when not all the solutions are able to have an active, active um, between the center implementation. Uh, one of the first action probably would be and smart to power on the, the compute nodes. You, the controllers usually, or at least some of them, need to be uh, always alive to receive the replication. But compute nodes, are, are, we, we don't want to power them on all the time doing nothing. Uh, First, the, the, the next step will be to uh, be sure that our uh, databases are uh, read-write mode. As I said before, it could, if, if it's master-slave, probably we need to elect to master the, the slave databases and remove the old master from, from the cluster together. Um, uh, consistency. Uh, if it's if it's master master, we need to maintain the quorum again. So we need probably to kick out of the cluster the failed nodes in, in the failed data center, and having our let's say replica database able to 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 write. Uh, similar thing need to be done for the block storage. Uh, if it's distributed, we need probably to gather the quorum because uh, the split brain problem here is it's, it's uh, happening all the time. It's two sides. One is failed, the other one don't know to be the one that is in charge. 
uh, object storage is the same. Uh, need to gather the quorum. You need to probably kick out of the cluster the failed nodes, probably even decrease the number of replica because the, the replication will start after the failure and probably will mm, uh, fill up the space and these kind of problems. And then there is the real evacu evacuation. So if, if the architecture is done correctly, we can uh, restart our virtual machine in the, in the recovery site. And then the network part is it's the last step that we need to take care. So our floating IP, for example, are, were routed through the failed site. We need to, to do something to have that redirected to the uh, recovery site. So this is how we, we are uh, implementing this. Uh, you can see there all the replication that go through. We have our database, our block storage, object storage. We are willing to have even up uh, a solution that can handle active, active sites. But the, each one will receive the replica of the data of the other one in that case. So again, the, the limitation and what, what is the starting point to implement this is the network. The delay is it's, it's the main problem here that can limit the possible solutions. Network failure, this is our idea. So floating IP uh, are not normal IPs, but are any cast addresses. And we can, we can leverage, for example, ExaBGP, that's a very hand, useful tool that through the uh, uh, freezer DR agent that it's on all the compute nodes, uh, he will un for every virtual machine uh, that is start over there, he will fetch the floating IP of that virtual machine and start to announce them to our uh, autonomous system. Uh, once a disaster is hap has happened and we are evacuating the data center, the agent that run in the compute node on, on, the, uh, on the recovery data center will detect the new IPs and start announcing them through, through the, the aut autonomous system and the, the traffic will be redirected automatically. Thank you. If if you have any questions, thanks. So if there are any uh, questions, please go to the, to the microphone. We have been a little bit, uh, we extended a bit probably, so sorry. Uh, Hi. Just one question because uh, you mentioned that the engine, the freezer engine is making the decision actually which host needs to be uh, rebooted, right, fenced, and so on, so on. And that's usually like the, the tricky part to detect properly and reliably actually which host is down and which host is up, right? And uh, as far as I understood, you basically rely on the Nova and Neutron status of the service status, right? Yes, so we, we start from there because, you know, uh, both Nova and Neutron have continuous communication between, the, let's say, the server side and the client side. Uh, if they are detecting a host down, we have issues. So it, it's at least the starting point. For, uh, that node is not usable anymore. Mm -hmm. So there could, there could be virtual machines still running there and working, but we are not for sure able to spin up new virtual machine. No, so I'm just, what I'm trying to say that basically, my, I don't know, maybe this is not the best reliable way of detecting this because there are projects like Pacemaker which does it, right? And well, we all know that probably sometimes like communication between the Nova compute and, and, and uh, conductor is not perfect and sometimes it hangs and Definitely. then you have, the, you have the, the, the status of the services down, but basically the VMR is still up. So 
Yeah. Definitely. I, I, I totally agree. We have been thinking about this for quite a long time. And um, um, even pacemaker or similar solution to be, to be implemented. But in a, from our point of view, it's going to add more complexity. Yeah, the you feet, have yeah. something more to maintain <coughs> and manage. And when you scale out, you need, it's another component that you need to reconfigure, add, and, 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 and take care of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. So uh, for sure, Nova Neutron, it's not enough for us to be sure that the node is failed. It's only the starting point for go through a, a, a list of other checks and only if all the check confirm that the host is down, like if the, let's say, the, the power source is gone, you can go through EPMI tool with EPMI and you will see that the power is off. So, so the plan is basically to replace this kind of uh, Nova status check or neutron status check by something else more reliable. Uh, it's 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 only it's a, a list of checks. So yeah. uh, we don't advise to use only one, but to to use a, a list of them. And even the the idea there is to have kind of if all of them confirm the host have failed, we take action. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. One thing is <clears throat> that we need to use first uh, the, the API from OpenStack services that provides that information because it's fundamental that we integrate with other OpenStack services. And then on top of that, we can use other, other also because that services are available, more likely. So that, that was another choice, but that is uh, definitely a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Hi. The, uh, two things. The, the integrity protection features is really impressive. Good job. Regarding the recovery part, when you recover the virtual machine in a recovery site, it seems we are respinning the VM with the brand new UIDs for VM, the, the sender block, the neutron ports, everything, right? These are brand new UIDs. They are not retaining the old UI IDs from the crashed uh, one? They should, because the idea there is to use the Nova Evacuate that usually do a good job maintaining the right IPs and floating IPs and you, the UUID. So it's simply an evacuation of a failed node. The Nova will maintain all the IDs. OK. How about the neutron port? It's supposed to do the right thing okay. <laughs> and, and maintain and recreate the open the switch if it's the, the, right. the that, that neutron backend in the right way. That was my concern because if there's brand new stuff, somebody has to go clean up the old stuff in the DBs. Definitely. So the most challenging part will be probably to restore the failed site when we want because then we even need to resynchronize everything in the other way around. And it's probably more challenging than managing the failure, managing the restoring of the, the standard situation. Right. But you know, we didn't want to reinvent the well. So there are a bunch of guys that are working very heavily on the host evacuation and the live migration in Nova. And we really would like to use their uh, efforts and, uh, and not reinventing everything. All right, thank you. And one thing is that uh, we waited the, the summit to finalize the DR <coughs> uh, blueprint. So the, the blueprint is there with the requirements. So any improvement, anything that you think is wrong, just go there, right there, put minus one, minus two, anything you need, and let's, let's do it. So any other question? Okay, so it was honestly a pleasure. Thanks for your patience and thank you. Thank you. Thanks.